Uh, welcome, Marshall Gibbs. Uh, welcome to our first of many or possibly first and only podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope it's first of many. That sounds like a better answer. Uh, so my goal here with with this interview and, and hopefully the ones to come will be to help our clients get more perspective and actionable insights for their businesses by interviewing experts in different domains. Um, so today we've got you, Marshall Gibbs. Um, Marshall, you're CCG's fractional COO, and I'll just do a short introduction here. So Marshall Gibbs is a seasoned chief operating officer and chief technology officer with a passion for growth using organization, process, and technology to scale profitably. Marshall was most recently the president and COO of Target Data, a people-based marketing agency. He was responsible for operations as well as analytics, applications, and infrastructure. Prior to Target Data, Marshall was the CTO of Target Base, where he led the design of integrated marketing solutions for measurable customer engagement. He also served as CTO and CIO at Information Resources, Inc., where he developed a new core technology offering direct, directed all IT infrastructure, applications development, program portfolios, and product service offering development, and served as GM for the company's loyalty analytics business. Marshall is an author of 20 plus patents and patents pending in transportation and data sciences for analytics. He is a graduate of the University of Florida with a degree in computer systems and holds a master's degree in business administration. So again, Marshall, welcome. We're, we're glad to have you. Jay, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Awesome. So let me start by trying to frame what I'm hoping that we can accomplish today, and then we'll dive into the questions. So in my role at CCG as a consultant and in my role as a business owner, um, I've noticed that most businesses always, almost always have somebody in a COO type role. Um, it, it really is a role that is essentially required to run the business. And somebody's always sitting in there. But we don't often know as business owners whether the person in that seat is up to the appropriate level or if we're getting the most out of that function. And so what I want to do today is try to help define with try with your help to define what it means to be rock solid in the COO function of a business. So just with a quick definition, a little bit of context. The way I'm thinking about the COO function is it's the, the key operational leadership function in the business. It is not the director of operations. It's not the leader of the operations department, but rather it's the person that is coordinating all activities of the business across all different departments, typically reports right into the CEO um, and is essentially the, the person who makes all the trains run on time and executes the vision. Is, is that the right understanding of the role, Marshall? It is. I think one of the things that makes a COO role particularly challenging is there's not a good, uh, clear definition of it. It adapts to the organization that it's in. Um, and so there's a, a lot of variation. But generally, I think about it much the way you described it. I often think about it from the standpoint that the CEO defines uh, what I like to think of as the where and the COO is accountable for the how. And that blend is incredibly important. And there's a great example of thinking about sort of decomposing a trip. If you're standing on the East Coast and need to get to the West Coast and your CEO says, California is the place we ought to be, um, the COO's job tends to be, okay, awesome, love that. Um, I'm not even worried where in California we need to be. When roughly do we need to be in California? Do we have any restrictions? Can we walk? Can we fly? Can we drive? Um, by the way, do you want to stop anywhere along the way on the way to California? Right? It becomes a little bit more of that. That's your job as COO is to sort of decompose that and think about how we're going to get the organization from the East Coast heading towards the West Coast knowing that you'll adjust along the way as you go. I really like that, Marshall. And I like also <clears throat> you explained in there the, the partnership between the CEO and COO and even just expressed a little bit of the feeling and the kind of the, the back and forth. 
So I'm looking forward to diving into that in a, in a little while in some of our questions, because I think that's a really important element uh, of this role and understanding this role. Um, so just a little bit of context for our listener. Most of the businesses we work with have senior leadership teams. Typically, we encourage them to have leaders in sales, operations, and finance, amongst other roles, but at least those major roles. And those leaders then report into the COO type role. Uh, And in some cases, especially for our smaller businesses, the CEO is often operating as the COO. Uh, The owner, CEO, and COO are all kind of mushed up together at the top of that organizational chart. Uh, but but hopefully today we'll get some picture on how those roles can be separated. So let me start, Marshall, with a question which you already started to give us a little bit on is, what does a COO do? I like to um, I like to think about the COO job from the standpoint of a phrase that I use a lot when I'm working with a CEO. Uh, it's a yes and job. It's not a no but job. It is a yes and job. Um, and so your job largely is to figure out um, what you, what the CEO is trying to accomplish and what the organization as a whole is trying to accomplish. And then as the COO, uh, in a predictable, uh, scalable way, help the organization figure out how it does what it needs to do to accomplish the CEO's vision or goals of, or the organization's vision or goals of where it's actually going. Um, the job day to day varies a lot, but the key elements I really look for for somebody to be able to do the job well are uh, a lot of vision different from the CEO. Your vision needs to be uh, looking forward towards uh, things that are going to get in the way, things that are going to create problems, um, things that are going to prevent you from achieving the goals like scaling up or growing or acquiring the right talent. Um, and having the mechanisms of the organization headed towards uh, overcoming any of those object, those, those uh, opportunities or, or challenges that might be in front of you as you go through it. Um, you know, your job is to make the organization continue to evolve and get better uh, in a profitable way. Great. So some of the, you mentioned the day-to-day is uh, different for every organization. If you went up, let's say one level of abstraction from the day to day, but but a little bit more granular than what you just described, what are the different categories of things that a COO is thinking about and working on? Um, it's usually in a few different a few different camps. Um, the one th- the main thing or one of the core things that a COO in order to be effective in any organization to be effective. Uh, should be occupying a lot of your time is what am I measuring? Am I measuring the right things? And am I getting accurate measurements, right? So in order to operate the organization, you've got to have some feelers. You've got to have those signals coming in that tell you that the organization is either, uh, you know, failing in some fashion or succeeding in some fashion um, that are truly predictive and truly indicative of, what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And those things will evolve over time. So a big part of the COO's job is to be pretty paranoid that you don't have the right measures in place and be thinking about what, um, how they should be evolving, what they should say and what they should do. So big piece of it's working with the other parts of the organization to make sure that the uh, uh, measures uh, are in place and that you have a culture that is fulfilling the mission of measurement necessary to make sure that the uh, that what you're getting is is good for being able to to uh, make the job work. The second is very much a servant leadership role. It is working with those other leaders in the organization to support them. They have a mission to do, so making sure that their mission is clear, that their um, mission is well defined relative to their peers. Um, and that they have what they need to be able to get their mission accomplished and that the communication is flowing the right way through the organization is uh, critical. Um, The next piece that should be taking up your COO's time are those um, cross-functional processes. Anything that's a core process for your organization that's running across those functions is your job. 
and needs to be something that you are focused on making sure is uh, working the right way, doesn't have any hiccups in it, is robust and redundant and able to uh, continue operating no matter what happens. I think um, one of the things that's kind of interesting to see for COOs is how did your organization react to something like COVID, something that was you know, pretty much a black swan event in a lot of ways, completely different. Did your COO or your integrator, your leader and your teams, um, how did they react to it? When, kind of what was their timing? And then how did they go about figuring out how to react? Um, a lot of uh, good COOs job is contemplating what, what are we gonna do if it goes wrong, if it goes badly. Right. Uh, and that's, you know, that's where you'll spend some time. So you've got the measurement piece. Let's say uh, you've got a great COO, they've got all sorts of measurements in place. What are they doing with that? Um, that's a tricky one in the sense that uh, in many cases, there's a lot of measurements in place. The thing to be really focused on there are which ones um, are predictive of what is going to happen next, um, either in, in very specific ways within the organization or towards the overall goals of the organization. Um, and so that can be a place where um, you really want to make sure that, you've, that, that you're focused on the ones that are um, are going to make a difference to the organization. You weed out the other ones because uh, one of the things that tends to be true about measurement in an organization uh, ha has to do with the old axiom that you know you can't manage you can't manage what you don't measure. But on the other hand, people will spend a lot of time managing their measurement in ways that can be counterproductive if you're not careful about how you put those things in place. So. Um, keeping it simple, keeping it um, directed and in the right direction for what you're trying to accomplish is key. And then the, the other part of it, of course, is pay attention to them. What are they telling you and what are you doing about what they're telling you? Are they telling you that you have inefficiencies or opportunities for efficiencies in certain places? Do you have quality problems? Do you have customer problems? Do you have uh, delivery problems, or in many cases, they're not problems, they're opportunities. We actually have the ability to do this better, faster, um, really set ourselves apart in the, in the space from our competitors because we measure this and we know how well we do it. So this is a very generic question. And so just fill in any blanks that you need to to answer it. But let's say that the COO is looking at a dashboard of all the right measurements and sees a customer satisfaction problem. What is that thought process and action process that that COO takes to, to start to fix that? Uh, it's a little bit of uh, information gathering first. Um, if you have a, a solid, a lot of it has to do with sort of the maturity of your organization. If you have a solid leadership team, getting the leadership team together around that particular problem, um, looking for additional data that you can gather about what the root cause of that problem might be. Um, if you're going after, in this case, if it's a customer sat issue, why are we having problems with customer sat and decompose that? Um, and then look for opportunities to obviously take corrective action. Um, usually within a framework of, you know, cost, scale, speed that you're trying to accomplish at the same time. It could be that um, in some organizations, you know, customer sat doesn't need to be perfect. We are at a place where customers are going to tolerate a little bit less than perfection in what we're doing. It could be that, nope, this is our differentiator, in which case it's a much more serious issue um, and you need to get down on top of it very quickly uh, and start to drill into the issue uh, itself. And that, that's an interesting point, Marshall, because I think for a lot of the teams that we work with at CCG, we will have strong leaders in place, but it's very often that those leaders will not have that context that you just described of understanding how important is a particular metric um, or how does it play into the bigger picture. And it, what I'm hearing you say is it's really the COO's job to help, <clears throat> maybe not necessarily <clears throat> excuse me, maybe not necessarily solve that problem, but 
but understand the importance of that problem and direct the coordination around solving it as it's as it relates to the vision uh, that they have of achieving the vision that, that the CEO has. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's often the case that if you think about that role of COO, they don't really have the direct control of a lot. They Their job is to organize the teams and the efforts and make sure they're directed and going in the right, you know, the right way to accomplish what it is and then make sure that the outcome comes out. But their ability to directly do something is limited to exactly what you said, prioritizing resources, prioritizing efforts around what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And I think because of that reason, we see often that CEOs might discount the importance of a COO role because, or or not realize what that COO should be doing because sometimes that COO isn't necessarily doing much. They're not owning a particular sales metric or they're not owning a particular uh, outcome in a particular department that requires them to be in meetings all day around a certain focus, but rather they have to keep everything in mind. And and in in essence, like a captain has the wheel uh, hand on the wheel of the ship, you know, that hand might not be exerting a lot of force, but it's holding the ship steady and keeping the ship going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So tell me, Marshall, what is the difference then between a small business owner, a COO, a CEO, and a director of ops? It's a lot packed in that question, but just take it from whichever direction makes sense first. Uh, A lot of it has to do with scale of the business that you're trying to operate. So if you think of those not as people, but as roles, then depending on where you are and your scale and what you're doing, often you wear more than one of those hats at the same time. Yep. Um, and you're, you're kind of figuring it out and pulling it apart as fast as you can. I think our experience has shown us that often with entrepreneurs as they're getting going, um, there's a reluctance to uh, move towards the more strategic and visionary thought process. There's a feeling that I need to be doing the business. It's a overall cultural thing for uh, certainly in the United States, this notion that if I'm not working 80 hours a week as an entrepreneur, I'm failing and I'm not living up to the, you know, what it is I'm supposed to be doing. Um, And coupled to that often is this notion um, that I need to be the one doing things, that, that, I'm somehow, I've got a little bit of an imposter syndrome if I don't have this specific role that I have to, uh, I have to accomplish. And so as the, as the organization grows, what you should very naturally see is that sort of uh, from, the, from the most direct person, which is going to be that director of operations, very tactical, very focused on the functions that actually produce whatever it is that the organizational the organization uh, produces um, should should be supported by, but not burdened by things like HR and finance and the other ancillary functions that lay around that, usually not burdened by sales and is really focused on sort of efficiency, redundancy, the ability to make the, the core product happen over and over again. Um, and I want to, I want to see that happen. The small business owner on the other side should be moving towards, um, in that role as owner, uh, looking at uh, strategic opportunities. And do I, am I trying to grow? Am I trying to pull money out? Am I trying to extend what I'm trying to do? Um, but in that role as small business owner, not necessarily operating in the business. In the role of CEO, your job, like I said, is the where. What is the vision of where it is that we're trying to get to? Um, and defining that and communicating that well and often uh, is key. And that role grows a lot and usually has some amount of uh, sales and marketing associated with it because you're also selling the vision of the company. You're either selling it if there's an owner to the owners you're selling it to the marketplace, you're selling it uh, more broadly as, as you go out in the world and talk to people, um, and you're always looking for what is the next thing that's gonna happen. 
Um, and then as we've discussed, the COO's role is that glue to make sure that the operating components are working the right way and that they're really well aligned in this relationship. And it's very much a trust relationship with whoever's wearing that CEO hat. The, the practical application of that, as we see a lot with companies, is a CEO who still holds functional roles in the organization and, um, and is afraid in a lot of ways to let them go. They're afraid that they don't have people who can pick them up the way that they would pick them up. They're also afraid that people will ask them that same question you asked, which is, what do you do if you're not doing that? Right. And that's a real key area to get into and understand that the CEO should be really driving the vision and direction of the business and looking for opportunities for the business, not hands-on, you know, executing some component of the business. Right, right. It, it's interesting because when I think about a lot of the businesses uh, that we work with, a lot of small businesses, I think what I'm hearing you say is that a lot of the small business owners need to ask the question of what seat do they truly want to sit in or what seat does their business truly need to accomplish the vision they have for their business. And for many of them, I, you know, I see a lot of overlap between the owner and the CEO roles. A lot of times they are the dyed in the wool entrepreneur with that clear vision of the future that nobody else can see, but they know is there. Um, Sometimes less often they're the COO, uh, or they can do a good job at doing all of those at a certain level. And as you alluded to, I think less often as companies grow, do we see them being successful as I- I- embedded within the business? And in fact, often they end up, and I speak from experience myself of, of having gone through this process, they end up uh, often causing a lack of uh, organization or a lack of structure, a lack of consistency because they're the owner and they've always shot from the hip. Mm-hmm. It's always worked. And that ends up disrupting what a great COO might end up doing. So you alluded to this earlier, but w- at what different sizes do these roles become more uh, important or imperative of, of companies? Mm-hmm. I tend to think of it, um, it, it's easiest to think about it, I think, for entrepreneurs around sort of a count of people, probably more than anything else, right? And so anything up to a dozen to 15 people, often you're not going to see a lot of differentiation in those roles. There's your, um, the need to separate the, the uh you know, the roles and also the finances to be able to afford different people to do those tasks often are not there. If the finances are there, the organization will benefit from separating these roles. There is almost never a question that that's true. Um, But for most people at the revenue level associated with where they are, you can get by with managing things directly without having a, a COO and having someone manage both roles. It might be CIO and COO are actually the same person, which I've seen, uh, or uh, CFO and COO uh, often are the same person, um, which I've seen uh, successful in a couple of roles as they go. Um, Beyond that, you really, you know, kind of beyond that 15 headcount mark, uh, you need to be thinking about separating these roles and having somebody who really uh, leads the functions of the organization and partners with the CEO on where the organization is headed. The next sort of threshold I see is usually in that 25 to 30 range of people. This is where you have to have started putting in place um, organizational and procedural structures that do the job of the COO in certain cases in some ways, right? That's where you're culturally and organizationally building uh, processes, procedures, separations of duty and so forth to help the organization scale so it doesn't need people directing things on a regular basis. Usually this is where a good founder CEO struggles. Tell me about that struggle. This is usually where I run into a couple of things that'll happen that are great indicators that um, something's pretty broken and, and this separation needs to, uh, to be addressed. 
Um, often it comes in the form of the C uh, CEO becoming frustrated uh, that they that, that the organization and them by extension used to be able to do X easily with a couple of people. And now you're telling me there's all this structure in the way and I can't just go do X. It happens all the time, right? And, it, and, it's, and it's usually good hearted. The thought is not wrong. I'm trying to satisfy a client demand. We want to extend something we already offer to somebody, or I'd like to get this client up and running super fast, and I don't want to go through the paperwork process or whatever it is that, that is getting in the way. Uh, that's a great place where you should be having that conversation about whether your COO is, uh, the, or the person's in that function, is really fulfilling the need uh, that's there for that CEO to be able to achieve what they want. But that's that's one of the places where things will start to get uh, very sticky. Um, and the other thing that tends to happen in uh, in that exact same time frame with the CEO uh, is a bit of a disconnect because again, it comes back to this: I don't know what to do every day. Right. Right. And and I and I'm feeling like now the organization runs without me and I'm not as in tune with what's going on in the organization on a daily basis. And again, your COO, that person in that role, should be doing a great job of making sure that you are in tune with what you need to be in tune with in the organization. Those are really critical features of being a successful COO to a CEO. It's gotta be a great partnership relationship lots of trust, lots of transparency. But as the COO, you have to understand the needs of that CEO and be ahead of them and make sure that they're met, right? He's got a board to, re to respond to, or he has a, a uh, 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 an investor to respond to, or he's got a spouse to respond to and, and say, hey, you know, the business is doing great. It's really crucial that that function be there. And it's usually about that point at 25 to 30 people is where they start to feel this disconnect because things happen without them. Right. So you alluded to this, and, and I think this is a really important question. How does a world-class COO relate to a CEO? What should that relationship look like? Um, it has a bunch of features. I think of it mostly, uh, it's a trust relationship. It is. Um, it has to have a very high degree of confidence both ways because a lot of information is moving around a lot. And so uh, that, that confidence that the CEO is sharing with you as the COO, the, all of the things that are necessary for you to do your job effectively, and likewise, as the COO, you are sharing with that CEO and making sure he or she has visibility to everything they need to have visibility to and isn't going to get caught short in something. Um, that's really key. Uh, the COO job should be, and I, I use this carefully, should be an egoless job. The CEO's ego trumps your ego. Your job is to allow the CEO to be CEO. He's going to go out there, he or she is going to go out there and be the face of the company. Often they address the company overall, even though as COO, these leaders report to you and you set all these things in motion. The CEO addresses the company and talks about what it is we're doing and where we're going overall. Um, you have to trust your CEO when he reaches through you and he has to trust you enough that he never reaches around you to get to an organization. He goes through you to get to the organization. I don't mean that in a, in the, uh, in the way of, of delegating work. I mean, I, you should have no problem when the CEO picks up the phone and talks to your direct reports or your direct reports, direct report. You just have to have a process and a structure in place that keeps that, flow of information going the right way. And we used to have a rule at one of the organizations I was at, when the CEO calls you in order, acknowledge what he asked you to do to him and make sure that he got what he needs out of the conversation. 
then send me a note and tell me what he asked you to do. <laughs> and so we can make sure that he doesn't necessarily know what all your priorities are. He doesn't know what's on your plate. He doesn't know anything else. And then third, please don't do anything until we talk. Right, right, right. Because often the CEO called me and asked me to do X and, and the world ends and off they go, right? So there's an interesting thing that I hear you saying, Marshall, which is, um, is ties into your, your phrase earlier, yes and job, which is where I think I see a lot of COOs feeling that they need to be a um, linebacker for the organization and kind of keep the, keep the CEO out of the organization. But what I'm hearing you say is, no, no, the CEO needs to have that access and there needs to be a trusting enough relationship where, where that access is possible and we build and manage around some of the disruption that might happen on account of that. So it's, again, a yes and rather than, no, let's put up a wall because that's going to, to cause a disruption that's going to take us off course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. And I think that that is absolutely critical to being successful in the role and allowing the company to grow and evolve in the way it should. If um, And I, I think about it this way, the COO's job should always be challenging. If it's not, then the CEO isn't doing their job correctly. Be because if, if unfettered by the whims, directions, challenges, and changes of my CEO, I will build an operating organization that runs like a top. Problem is the CEO sees that people aren't buying tops anymore and we actually need to be shifting gears here and looking in a different space. Well, if you could speak to that a little bit more, Marshall, what is a great, what should a great COO expect or want from their CEO? Um, I think the, the thing that you're counting on for that CEO, as you said, is that they have the ability to, to figure out where to go next. Um, they also have the ability to make decisions. That should be inherent in the role. Like I'm actually looking for a, in a CEO, a good senior executive. I want someone who listens to input. I want someone who, um, as I said, makes decisions and is willing to move and make things happen. Um, I want someone who's engaged in our industry and in our marketplace and is trying to advance the cause of the business overall. Um, but I also want someone who has the emotional maturity to have a, you know, this trust relationship with the rest of the organization, which is very much a, you know, two way, two way street in, in how that has to work. Um, and so those are really the, you know, the, the things that I, when, if I was hiring a CEO, that's what I'm going to look for is some somebody who's um, able to build and have that kind of relationship and demonstrates it. You, you said something, Jay, that I thought was interesting and I'll comment on. Often when I see dysfunction in CEOs, um, it's because the organization has built up walls that frustrate that CEO. CEOs typically by nature got to be CEOs because they're trying to get things done. And so the more the organization tries to become rigid and calcified and protect itself from those things, the more dysfunctional that relationship with the CEO becomes. In, in, its, um, in, in essence, it's a, a, there's a tension there between perhaps the, the more turning on a dime, satisfying a particular need, uh, chasing a particular part of the vision, the change inherent in that, and the constance, constancy or consistency required of running an organization really neatly and tidily. And what I'm hearing you say is that the two leaders who embody those, perhaps those two different elements, a very broad generalization, the two leaders need to have a respect for both sides of that. 
So the mm-hmm. COO needs to res- have, have that trust and respect that, look, we're going to need a little bit of turbulence in order to uh, get to our destination uh, and find the right destination to get there. And the CEO needs to understand that, well, I have to have trust in the COO to, to take the organization where we've decided that it's going to go. Mm-hmm. What are some of the more common challenges when, when a business owner or CEO decides that they want to bring in a COO, let's say around that 20 person, 25 person mark, Mm -hmm. what are the most common challenges and growing pains that you see in having that COO get up and running and successful? Um, The most obvious one is that there's usually somebody doing that job, at least nominally. And so unless that person has said, man, I hate this job or I suck at it and, and is, you know, actively trying to jettison it, there's usually a bit of a challenge because people didn't necessarily think it wasn't being done or wasn't being done well. So there's a, uh, there's usually a little bit of friction when you first come into an organization uh, around that. The, the corollary to that is the CEO was doing that job. Um, and so part of the job is, is helping to move those responsibilities that the CEO is doing into this new role. That one can be a bit interesting because it tends to fall into two categories. And the same CEO usually has some amount of both of these categories. Um, category one are the things that they think they do really well. And that they need, they, they, they struggle to let go of. They want to hang on to, I'm going to continue to be the finance guy. I'm going to hang on to our finances. You don't need to worry about that. I'm going to be the finance guy, right? As an example of one of those things that they just have a hard time saying somebody else is actually going to manage the finance function and, and we'll get it where it's going to go. Um, and so there's a little bit of that. I need to hang on to something piece of the equation. The other side is the list of stuff they've been compiling for the last 36 months that they don't want to do anymore. <laughs> that is, that, that's either not being done, not being done well, or you know, is being done well, they just don't want to do it anymore. Right. And that comes your way as you, know, you now are responsible for all of this that needs to happen and this is the direction it needs to go in. Um, so that process of sorting that out and getting it organized and facilitated correctly uh, is usually a big piece of the equation. And and there's plenty of methods to sort of focus on what are our objectives? What are our objectives for the quarter? What are we trying to do three years from now? How's the organization set up? Do we have functions that have accountability for these things that you wish to dump off your plate, et cetera. Um, But it takes facilitating that whole conversation and making the CEO comfortable that these things are being done. Right, right. On the flip side of that, prior to that hire, I think a lot of business owners and CEOs, even of sizable businesses, will say, well, this will probably be the most expensive when they, they go out and do a search. Uh, or even start the search process, talk to the recruiter, and the recruiter says, hey, it's going to cost you, you know, anywhere from whatever it might be, one hundred fifty to $300,000 a year, plus bonus, plus profit share, whatever it might be. And very often, that's where the conversation stops, because a business owner or CEO says, well, look, that's a cost, and it's not a sales function, so I can't say that there are targets that are going to be hit. Uh, it's not a finance function. So I can't say we're going to save this amount of money. So how do you justify that cost? What are some of the things that, that a, a business owner or CEO will get when after that point of 15 to 20 people, they install a COO that would justify that level of initial cost without a clear sense of this is going to pay me back this return? Um, it really comes down to a couple of uh, items that um, that need to be important to the organization. Typically, a COO is really useful because you want to scale. You need to be able to grow. 
Um, and so coordinating all the functions and features of the organization to accomplish scaling and growing uh, is important. And, and so the, the measurement of that, the ability to see the outcome of that is really asking yourself as the CEO for my next objective in terms of the scale of this organization is the leadership team as it's assembled today, including myself and the function and the way that it's working, is that gonna allow me to get to this level of scale that I wanna get to? While also permitting me to contemplate the next level of scale that I wanna be able to get to. So that, that ability to scale um, is one. And the second one is the ability to focus on the things that as the CEO, are actually important to growing the business. Might be key vendors, key accounts, thinking about where the industry is headed next, the things that you can get out there and do that freeing up your time buys you. And that's really, you're spending your 300 grand on buying you as the CEO more time and buying the organization the ability to scale out and continue to grow. Right. With the, with the implication that that scale will, will drive a return on that investment. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So just a couple more minutes here, Marshall, I have a couple of um, uh, actually one more question. And then if we have time, a couple of little rapid fire sort of case questions. So the, the last question here is what are the top one, two or three things that people most commonly misunderstand about the COO role? Um, I think the most important one uh, is the COO role can become a project management role if it's not thought through correctly. And in fact, if your COO pretty much is just your head project manager, if you really kind of take a step back from it and look at it, you probably don't have the right person in that role. There's an aspect to the job that is literally, here's what we're trying to accomplish. Let's break down the steps. Let's make sure we've assigned the resources and let's task manage and make sure we get it done day in and day out. But that's not your real job. It's a thing that needs to be done to be successful. Um, But if that's what's really happening, then um, you probably don't have the right person being a, a, a COO in, in that particular case. And just, uh, to, just to jump in there on the other side of that, the thing that they should be doing is what? So the thing that they should be doing in addition probably to that particular function is organizing around, organizing the company um, around the objectives that need to be accomplished in the near term and in the farther term. Um, Uh, and communicating those objectives um, in the form of the direction that the functions need to evolve or new functions need to be added or changed to get where it is that you're going. It's more about evolving and modifying and simplifying an organization than task management. Understood. Okay. And any other commonly misunderstood aspects of that COO role? Uh, The other one is exactly what uh, we talked a little bit about before. The COO becomes the director of operations. um, And that's the other one. It is actually important for the COO to have visibility across all of the lead functions. And the most common two places I see a little bit of conversation happen is the finance function, um, uh, which is always interesting, and the sales function. Often the CEO functions as the you know lead uh, business development person as well, and and um, a, a conversation I've had on more than a few occasions is you can be the lead BD guy. That doesn't mean you manage sales. We're going to actually have a sales manager manage sales, and you can still be the most important sales guy we have. Right, or very often it's it's um, one thing that I've noticed is that you're doing sales, but you're here. It's more about building relationships and really key relationships and driving those sales, but you've got a team around you that's helping to 
accomplish that or you're sort of the tip of the spear and then you've got a whole department that goes in and and manages the 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 throughput yep great thank you marshall so a couple of uh very quick questions rapid fire let's try to you know to, to the extent possible we'll keep these relatively uh focused so how would a great ceo handle the following you've got two division leads who work together well most of the time but there's an undercurrent of com competition and one-upsmanship. And the business is functioning effectively, meeting its goals, but it feels like there's a landmine there. What does a great CEO do? How does a great CEO start to think about that kind of problem? Um, rapid fire response on that one is uh, honest and open communication with the people involved, um, a review of the alignment of their objectives and their accountabilities to make sure that you haven't inadvertently created the tension that currently exists. It may be that that tension is actually intentional that mm -hmm. you're that you've created, depending on what it is that you um, are focused on. Um, and then if those things don't work, uh, you know, it, and you can't figure out a way to, from a process perspective, make some changes there or get them emotionally on the same page and more cooperative, um, then it may become a different conversation that you have to have about separating them a little bit and either within the organization or potentially get one of them out of the organization. Got it. Awesome. How about, how would a great CEO think about sales and operations function that just cannot collaborate effectively. And, and this is the leaders wanting to collaborate and having the intention and desire to be there, but the department's just feeling like there's a, just a, a gap there between how they work together and lots of finger pointing back and forth. <laughs> Not an uncommon outcome, actually. <laughs> right. These are, these are sort of the greatest hits. <laughs> or how those things work. Um, <laughs> Uh, usually in that case, I see a few things that um, can make a difference. A lot always comes back down to process. Is the process document is clearly understood. People understand what they're trying to do. Um, the second is thinking about process from a um, um, individual's full accountability perspective. So uh, in some cases, that's a, there's a misalignment there uh, where two people are trying to accomplish the same thing, but their goals are just misaligned. So if the sales guy's goal is volume, flow, how fast can I get things through the organization? And the operations guy's um, metrics are, I do one thing, I do it incredibly well, I get it completed, and then I move on to the next thing. Then you've created the situation that's going to cause that, right, that disconnect. So you have to really constantly look at the metrics, processes, um, and then ultimately comes down sometimes to leadership and people uh, focused around what it is that you're trying to do. It's interesting, Marshall, as you're describing this, we, we keep coming back to that metrics and process. And I'm getting a vision in essence of almost an engineer. And I know that you have a, a, a sort of an engineering background, so probably not a coincidence, but um, the COO as, as chief engineer of the business of, of the ways that all the processes and, and uh, goals and um, roles and all of those things, how they harmonize and come together. So really having that engineering mind of looking at all of those things systematically. Uh, agreed. It's very much the key. I think a, a really great COO integrates the view of the, of the human element in the organization into that notion. I think um, given the whole conversation we've had, and I like where you went on that, without a doubt, structuring things with process, with measurement, with um, accountability, well communicated and so forth are all things that put a, an architecture in place for how the business is supposed to work and a well thought out architecture is designed to bend, right? The example of skyscrapers that, that are designed to bend with the wind and so forth and so on. But the wild card is always the people that have to execute that the, the right way. And so a really good COO is constantly focused on the structure, but also the people. Do, have I done it in a way that the people can get their jobs done properly? Right, right, right. 
Last one, a um, little rapid fire here. So flagging revenue over the course of many years. How does a world-class COO say, all right, I've got to dig into this and, and break that break that revenue curse? You know, more often than not on that one, um, something has obviously been there for many years uh, that is causing the problem. And everybody probably knows why they're flagging revenues over many years and nobody wants to deal with the problem. And so one of the things that's really key with COO is you got to be fairly dispassionate and able to break things and move them, you know, and and the, the silly but obvious one is, hey, it's the CEO's brother-in-law who runs sales, and he's a lot more interested in lowering his handicap than actually getting sales done. Right, 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 right. Okay, awesome. Well, Marshall, this has been an excellent conversation. I've learned uh, quite a bit, and I suspect that our clients and listeners will also learn uh, a ton as well. Any closing thoughts? Uh, you know, uh, the only thing I will say is um, everybody generally in companies wants to do a good job. It's really inherent in senior leadership in a company to figure out how to work together and organize it to enable the people to do their best work. And if you do that, you will get the results you want to be able to get. Awesome. That is a wonderful way to end. Well, th thank you so much, Marshall. Thank you, Jay. It was fun.